I've been to a couple of Avia devs before, but I think this is the first time I'm speaking in Avia dev. So it's quite strange to not know the, the people I'm sharing the stage with other than Lasek, because Lasek and I go back a long way. Um, and I think also, John, you know, thank you very much for, for having me, but having me follow that narco presentation probably hasn't done me any favors, because it was really, really good. Um, and I read their white paper, which I recommend you all do. It's not um, overly cumbersome to do and very insightful, quite easy to absorb for um, someone like myself, a layman in the, in the aeronautical space, so really good. We have a mixed bag up here today, and we're going to talk a little bit about the investment landscape and, and how you can make investments at the airport attractive. But I think what's even more interesting is this non-aeronautical revenue piece for, um, for airports, what that means and also why that's attractive to investors. Yesterday, I was fortunate enough to be sitting in this seat doing the investor session for the hotels. Um, and so I thought I'd maybe just start with the quick kind of four or five bullet points of the, the key kind of takeaways from that session to tick that box um, and hopefully provide some insight. And then we can move into some intros of, of these fine gentlemen and, and um, talk a little bit more about, about the aerospace particularly. So, I mean, I think the, the, the five bullet points that I summarized at the end of our session yesterday was vis-a-vis um, -vis investment in the African context was given where interest rates are going, borrowing locally as much as possible to, or at least in local currency as much as possible to avoid FX exposure in the short term is quite quite valuable, particularly if your income is in local currency. Obviously, if you're, you're covered by Forex income, that, that makes a difference. Um, think about the local context, the needs of the specific investment that you're looking at. Um, within within an airport in this case, but the needs not just of the entire market, but of that specific site and specific project. Think long term. A big mistake a lot of investors coming into Africa do is, is they think that, you know, because it's a market that's growing so quickly, they're going to see returns very quickly. Not necessarily the case. In fact, most often not the case. Um, partner well, be that with the public sector or the private sector. Partner with specialists in. Um, whatever type of asset class you're developing, and then mitigate risk as much as possible via, and that's political risk, financial risk, via hedging, insurance, whatever kind of policies you can take, try and um, mitigate that risk as much as possible. Obviously, there's traditional vehicles available for borrowing, um, and also there's equity partners out there, and, and you know we'll talk about that a little bit. I think what was really interesting from the narco presentation and you know, I asked the question, is that a lot of African countries are agri-dependent or their economies are driven by agriculture, like much like Kenya, but we're still not seeing a lot of um, long-term food storage happening. That's an asset class that we as, we as Knight Frank and a lot of other companies are looking at quite closely. And the question is whether that happens at the airport, whether that happens somewhere else. Um, and, you know, a big question mark we get from growers is, well, we already have processing plants on site and land at the airport is quite expensive. There's a lot of politics involved at the airport. So, you know, we kind of prefer to control the processing and packaging on site and then just have it shipped through the airport. So that's it's going to be quite interesting to hear what Javid has to say, if, if anything, about what's going on in Bangalore. Um, but great. Thanks very much for having us. And I think I'll start with... Um, not with Hilton. I think I'm going to start with Lassie and come to Hilton last. Hilton has suggested very kindly to take us on a little bit of a, an imaginary journey um, to get the juices flowing a little bit um, at the end of our intro. So I'll start with Lassie. Lassie, please just give us a 30-second intro as to who you are, what you do, who Casada are, and then we'll move on through Patrick and Javed. <clears throat> May I first ask how many of you guys attended the, um, the previous conference? Hands up. How many? Okay. Okay. So there's a lot of new crowd. So uh, Casada Capital Management, we, we're pretty active hospitality investors. Last 36 months or so, we acquired and I suppose initiated about 20 hotel projects. Um, it's a private equity firm with two, two partners in it. 
It's a Qatar Investment Authority and, and Accor, Hotel, Accor Hotels. So whatever we acquire, whatever we develop, would be, would be operated by, by, by Accor. So um, yeah, in a nutshell. And what do I do? I'm head of, head of development. So I pretty much uh, look at, let's put it this way, any, any early phase developments that uh, come across our desk. And I have to say, I mean, I'm quite, quite pleased to be here because when we started off the fund, a mandate was at least 60% of the capital deployed would have been into greenfield developments and predominantly focusing on the, on the uh, economy and meat scale sector. And I would have expected with my 12 years of experience in Africa that quite a bit of that would have gone into airport hotels. We still don't have one. And it's not for the lack of trying, so hopefully that will bring about something. Thanks, Lasse. Yeah, we'll talk about airport hotels. That's coming your way soon. Um, Patrick, please give us a quick intro. Uh, good morning. Uh, Patrick Chonde, I'm the Acting General Manager of Finance, Kenya Airport Authority. Kenya Airport Authority controls, is in charge of uh, all of the airports in Kenya and uh, the largest in East Africa. Uh, what we do is uh, we manage the airports. My work is an acting general manager of finance. I manage the investments, finance of the authority. I have over 25 years experience and I also uh, facilitate in airport training, what we call international airport professionals, uh, globally based in Canada, where we facilitate, we train airport managers in terms of commercial and financial revenue. Thank you. Thanks. That learning and development piece is something that, yeah, Jared's smiling. We discussed it briefly at the, I was going to say the bar, but yeah. the, over coffee this morning. Um, Javid, please give us a quick intro. Good morning, everyone. I'm Javid Malik. I'm the chairman uh, of the advisory panel of Inc Innovation. This is an, a Spanish-based IT company. I've just started doing that for the last year. Uh, but for the last 37 years, I've been running airports and running airlines. Um, and I ran Bangalore Airport, so I was very, very pleased and happy to see uh, one of my flagship, one of the greatest airports in the world, as far as I'm concerned being used as a role model, and I just sent a message mm. to the CEO to sell him, you did it. Um, we, we delivered excellence by setting a benchmark of what it should look like. Uh, Mr. Rao Manuntala is actually the chief development officer. He's the gentleman that made all of those things come to life. I, I, I delivered them with him, but he came, made them come to life. And he's the gentleman that actually also built Singapore Smart City. So. Uh, that's why Bangalore is such a success, because Singapore is such a success when it comes to assets and retail particularly and uh, the infrastructure. But yeah, um, I was Group Chief Operations Officer for Seven Airlines, um, AirAsia Group across the Far East for the last four and a half years, and the COO for Bangalore Airport for four years prior to that, and then many other airline uh, senior roles are not relevant at this forum. But my last seven years have been about looking at technology and looking at process and infrastructure and how do you leverage monetizing those assets, whether they be, um, and we'll talk about you know, a, a simple warehouse shed that becomes a drone learning academy um, in, the, in the peak of COVID and drive revenues from a learning platform in a building that was a cargo shed, simply. So there are synergies in the technology and the people and the processes of bringing assets together to what our colleagues from NACO were describing, those building blocks do really come together and happily look to share those over these next few days. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Javid. Hilton, which is, by the way, you know, following on from a hotel conference, great name. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy for me to remember. L lots of people get me confused with Paris Hilton, but... Uh... I'm not going to say I can see why, but... <laughs> 
So my name is Hilton Carty. I'm the uh, managing director of Aperture Properties. We're a property development business, uh, and we are firm believers in the opportunity that exists in Africa. Um, and we have uh, a number of projects that are on the go at the moment. And, um, you know, one of the things that I have done since last conference is I've attended a whole lot of conferences. And uh, I attended the um, e-commerce Africa conference. I attended the Fresh Produce Conference. I attended the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Conference. Uh, and I attended the uh, Air Africa Cargo Conference. And the fascinating common thread there is that it all is about putting infrastructure together to move product in Africa, intra Africa, and out of Africa. And, uh, and so, as a business, uh, we are uh, enablers. We are not competitors with uh, the likes of Narco. We, are, we complement them. Uh, and, uh, and like you said, it's important to partner well. We've partnered very well. We have the biggest listed real estate investment trust partner with us in South Africa. We have the best professional team around us. And we would really like to engage with you guys and talk about the opportunities that exist uh, and share our knowledge, collaborate, uh, and make this thing a reality. Because what we need to do is we need to look into the future and what we've got to do, if you look around the room, the majority of the people in the room are on the elder side of the, of the scope. And what we've got to do is we've got to build facilities uh, for the consumer of the future. We to build co facilities for cargo of the future. And if we continue doing the things the way we've done them for the last 40 years, uh, I don't think that uh, there'll be a, a longevity there. We need, to, we need to think out the box. Thanks. I think that's, that's great. It's given us a bit of a flavor for who you all are. Um, uh, I tend to like to keep these quite free-flowing. So while I'll fire a question at a specific person based on you know, their area of expertise, let's call it that, I also like it when people say, well, actually, I've got something to add to that, and they jump in. So, you know, it'd be quite organic. I think that, you know, we've seen a lot of competition for money in the investment space, particularly, you know, this is a real estate-specific session. So when it comes to real estate, a lot of alternative asset classes have come up. And then within that, even more granularly, the locations that those asset classes are being developed and are being scrutinized and looked at more closely by investors to try and future-proof that investment. I think what Javed was saying regarding the flexibility or the, the pivoting of use of asset classes, turning sheds into learning centers or whatever that COVID brought along is really interesting um, and something we'll have a, have a bigger look at. And also the kind of vertical integration of, you know, and, and that obviously the NACA presentation was showing that, that kind of the tech piece and how that's automating a lot of activity and then also, you know, growing to storage, to export, to packaging, to all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, let's let's dive in. I think Javed, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about the journey around Bangalore and how, because you know, I think what's really valuable about this panel is that we have the local input here with Patrick, but then we also have this kind of international and global exposure and expertise that we should be learning from. You know, I spend a lot of time saying to my team as well, look at what's happening in South Africa, what's happened in South Africa, look at what's happened in Dubai or, the, or Europe further down that development cycle and, and that's where we're heading we can learn from those the mistakes they made now rather than make them ourselves so from that perspective Javed I mean what did you see as exciting investments that people made around Bangalore what were the kind of decisions to pivot into the real estate space for the airport and, and what did investors get excited about well, I'm going to talk about two particular ones. Um, and before I go to Bangalore, I actually I live and work from Malaysia, and that's my home for the last four and a half years. And Malaysia, from an agriculture point of view, is is substantial, particularly in the in the palm um, export, palm oil, particularly for them, but also rice as well. And one of the stories of sort of the opportunities that came about two years ago was in Malaysia we. Uh, at the airport, which is a large airport, um, and there are 17 other airports within the, within the country that we operated through. Um, 
we created this drone academy, and this, was, this had come out of COVID. Um, and this drone academy was initially an online platform uh, for me to find jobs for pilots who I'd actually made um, out of a job due to COVID. And I was really, really keen to wanting to find them a job. And I thought, well, the biggest problem that we have in aviation was, is one of the threats are drones flying into our airspace. So how do we manage that? Mm -hmm. At the same time, how do I get these guys into, into, into work? And of course, the pilots being trained by the Civil Aviation Authority are to the highest standard. And so I knew that they couldn't uh, reject the plan that said your pilots that you licensed are now going to train people to fly drones. That was the concept. How do I get them to become mm -hmm. trainers? And that, we created a platform and then we said, okay, well, we've got drones. Let's show people how to fly them. We needed a facility. And on the airport were several warehouses and storage facilities that had either shut down or were not really fully utilized. And with the airport, we managed to sort of bring one of them back to life, 8,000 square feet, nothing too large. But it, it became an academy with an online platform. And we created a subscription model like Netflix, fundamentally, that said if you wanted to do X weeks of training, you get trained by a pilot how to fly a drone properly, and then you can operate it safely. The industry became safer because people could operate properly, and we'd be able to get uh, a bit of revenue. That was the, the vision. To my surprise, in the first six hours, 1,100 farmers signed up to this program. I didn't know, and we didn't know, that we had 1,100 drone operators in Kuala Lumpur, but there were, and they all signed up to wanting to operate their drones over their, over their fields, over their various acreage for either um, uh, medicine sort of purposes or for uh, fertilization of it or for security purposes, but they wanted to learn. So we had these guys sign up. We now had three months of a waiting list to get people on, and I went from two pilots to nine pilots being the trainers. And so suddenly we saw this model that could be used in combination with a facility and technology and the ecosystem of people. Uh, and now we've got some young trainers coming from um, graduate schools as pilots who are doing the training. So that's become another learning pathway. So COVID really forced that, but it got us to look at what were redundant spaces within airports um, and how you could use them. And somebody, uh, a friend of mine asked me yesterday who's related to development within Kenya, and he was talking about the space at JKA, one of them. He said, oh, but one of the problems, you've got acres of land but they're right in the flight path and they don't know what to do. I said, well, there's a lot of different things that can be done that are within the constraints of flying. Yes, you can't put a hotel there, but there are other products. And I've given him the example of a single flat warehouse like a drone academy suddenly becomes something viable. So just wanted to put that out there in terms of Malaysia and what they're doing there. And in terms of Bangalore, Bangalore's probably greatest story is not actually the Bangalore cargo branding village as it's now become. Their greatest um, product came out of a short-term vision, um, and, and it's called the Quad. And you can see it on YouTube. It was a containerized city that was created in front of the arrivals area between the, cargo, between the car park and the arrivals. And it was meant to be put up there to basically make an eyesore building site into a pretty um, area with a bit of food and beverage um, in a pop-up type concept. And everybody that was put in there was, was given a maximum two-year lease, and you had to go in two years, the container was going to be lifted and gone. It has become the largest success of that airport revenue-wise, and now it cannot be removed by the pub. The public will not allow it to be removed. And simply, um, Subways, as one of the franchise models, have the world's largest per square revenue out of that space, because 48%, and I was there last in 2019 when I left, 48% of the customers were not flying customers. They were people coming from the neighboring suburbs to go and have a simple sandwich. And that's a $4 million business there for them. So um, this pop-up has become so popular that there are weddings being done there now. And we have destination weddings in the middle of an airport terminal with people coming from arrivals walking through and there's wedding ceremonies going on.
Mm. Um, there's bands. There are two pubs, brewery pubs that have popped up there within that same space now. And, and fundamentally, the airport is less reliant on now travellers for that revenue because most of the revenue now, and it's probably gone exceeding 50%, comes from, certainly would have done over COVID, comes from the uh, local suburbs, which are stretching back as almost 40 kilometres from the airport. And that's within the security cordon of the airport? It, it's, yeah, in the, in the concept of, of, of African airports like Kenya here, particularly where you are, a few miles have got a security cordon to get through. Mm. Yes, it would be within that space. Um, but actually, that, that lends itself to you're coming into a safer operating environment. You've gone through a check. It's actually a pretty safe place to be from, a, from an in entertainment point of view, from, a, from just a free-flowing of people point of view, because there's, there's less risk than being in a city centre, for example. Um, so, yeah, it, it works very well there. That was the catalyst for what you saw from NACO in terms of the other uh, asset classes being developed around the airport because it gave confidence that the airport aerotropolis, as it was, is going to be an attractive place for people to come and want to be. Not the, They have nothing to do with flying. The flying bit is just a bonus in terms of the growth of the country, but that's really... It's now uh, a, a, a very utilised asset class of products that happen to have an airport. That's super interesting. From the other way. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, if you're showing that kind of investment return, then it's a bit of a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, I was going to go to Hilton. I think I'm still going to go to Hilton. Hilton, talk to me a little bit about you when you're looking at developing something near an airport. What kind of stuff do you take into consideration? Does there, is there a difference between a privately run, owned airport and a public airport? What kind of proximity do you like to get within? Is there you know, a difference between being within that security cordon, whatever you want to call it, or a little bit further away? You know, we saw the different concentric circles that Narco presented. Give us a little bit about your kind of thought process to stuff. And then I'll come to Lasse about this investment and the hospitality F&B piece, because I thought that was really interesting. So our focus is on cargo. And, uh, and for you to have focus on cargo, you need to be, uh, if not on airports, Airside. You need to be. Uh, you need to have a common fence line so you can have access. Um, I think it's very important for you to know your customer. And I said, you know, previously that I'd like to take the audience on a on a bit of a virtual journey. Yeah. Uh, you know, we all are a bit older than than our kids. Uh, they are a lot smarter than we were when we were their age, uh, and they are absolutely different consumers. And when you understand your consumer, then you understand what you need to build. So the, the virtual journey is, uh, if you just think about vinyl records and music and how 50 years ago the only option was to buy music on vinyl, and we're not going to get into a debate about which one's better because we all know that answer, but uh, you, know, you went from vinyl to tape so you could actually play music in your car and not just have to have a gramophone record uh, to play the vinyl, it then morphed onto USB and today... You can stream music. And that's how the, the industry of music has changed. And, um, you know, you look at our, our kids today, uh, and there's pre-Uber tech and there's post-Uber tech. Uh, and the world post-Uber tech is a totally different world. You know, when, when I grew up, and you go play at a mate's house, the mother would make a plate full of sandwiches and make a, a jug of juice and call you in to come and play... Uh, today, when my daughter has friends around, you know, the doorbell rings four times and each one of them has ordered food from a different place and it's delivered by Uber and dad or mom's credit card gets hit. So this is the consumer of the future. And, uh, and when you understand that and you look at the numbers uh, and having attended the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Conference and you, and you listen to all these smart people talk, we've got this huge, huge mass middle market coming it's the, it's the enormous African promise. And what we need to do is we need to position ourselves for this enormous African promise. Uh, and the airports and the airlines, the airports are essential infrastructure. They have real estate. They have the desire to diversify their revenue stream. Uh, and what they need is they need people to partner with them who have real estate skill set. Because airports in the main have airport skill set. Airlines have airline skill set, and you need to partner with 
hotel people for the hotel side of it uh, and logistics people for the logistics side of it. And, uh, and so to, to answer your question, uh, where do we want to be? It all depends on what the airport has on offer. Okay, so important to engage with the airport. Every single airport will be in a different phase where they are, what's possible, what's not possible. Uh, what they want to do, have they had a master plan written, have they not had a master plan written. Uh, and you know, so it's all guiding airports through this process. Uh, and uh, property is a long-term play. Property is not an overnight success story, okay? And uh, what we've got to do is we've got to plan to create this cargo gateway into Africa, for Africa, to improve people's lives, okay? Uh, and one of the things that we need to do is we need to involve the community, we need to involve the youth, we need to specifically bring more women into the play. Uh, and in the logistics example, you know, as a bloke, you go out and you, you want to buy a friend a gift. You go to the bottle store, you buy a bottle of whiskey, and you come back and you put it on the table. And that's your gift. You know, women go out and they spend more time thinking about the packaging and how they're going to present it than the gift. And they put as much effort into the gift. And, you know, we need that kind of attention to detail in the logistics space. Because I shopped for the first time online. I bought a pair of running shoes. It arrived in a box that was three times the size it should have been. And you're paying for volume. Okay, now a woman would never allow that to happen. You know, a bloke just says, oh, there's a box, let's put it in, let's send it. So it's so very important for us to, to make it sexy, to bring in the technology, to encourage the youth, to bring women into the fold, uh, and to make this a long term sustainable business that the youth want to be involved in because they're going to be our consumers. And that's what we have to do. Interesting. And I mean, in terms of. You know, I think something that's probably quite vital to that is the routes that are flying into that airport, right? Yeah. Do you see a risk in, you know, investing in building a facility that's going to be servicing a route to wherever it is, and then the airport losing the relationship with the airline and, and that route no longer being available? Is that something that you guys that you think about? Is that something you've seen? So, so one of the one of the thought processes uh, that we have is that it. it doesn't necessarily have to only be airport specific. You can have a facility that caters for perishables, pharmaceuticals, high value goods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that part of it moves through the the airport, and a part of it moves through road or rail, uh, because airports are always conveniently located. They have accessibility. They have infrastructure around them, uh, and so you know, like Narco said. You, you start small and then you scale up. So you need, to have, uh, you need to have focus, and you need to focus on what you want to do. Don't go out and be a jack of all trades. Choose the products that you want to that are specific to the areas, pharmaceutical, perishables, high-value cargo. I mean, one of the statistics that, uh, that is out there is that Africa will have 870 million new smartphones in the next five years. Okay. So if we've got 870 million new smartphones in Africa in the next five years, we've got 850 million people who can be educated, who can be banked, who can shop online, who can, uh, who can find out what's the best product to use on their crops. They can drop a geolocator and the likes of a DHL can come and fetch their product. They don't have to have buckies. Okay, so the world is going to be a different world and Africa is going to be the best place to live. Yeah, and a more generic view on being a logistics hub rather than specifically catering to the airline industry. So, so you, you cater to the airline, uh, and as your routes grow and the airlines grow, I mean, when I, I drove through Africa from, from Cape Town to Copenhagen when I was younger, and, uh, and the campsite that we stayed in in Nairobi was in Upper Hill. Hmm. That was 30 years ago. Today we're sitting in Upper Hill right now, and I can't find the campsite. It isn't and, that's, there. and that's <laughs> urban creep, and that's the future. And, you know, what we should be doing is we should be thinking about Africa in 20, 30, 50 years' time. Mm. Uh, and that's the, that's the real estate play. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, like, like we were saying at the beginning, you've got to think long term, definitely. Um, Lassa, going back to you and, and something Javid said, I mean, if you've got a, an F&B outlet that's making $4 million a year, I mean, that's, that's a very easy investment decision to make. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you guys are on your, or maybe some of the, the reasons why you're not yet in 
the the airport hotel space and, and some of the opportunities you see for the hospitality industry, whether it's hotel, conferencing, F and B um, within airports. Oh, I, I did love the story. <laughs> I think that the, the solution might be just open a subway in a, in a in an airport hotel and they will come. I wish it was that simple. Um, Firstly, maybe I'll start talking about why, when would an airport hotel be successful, right? I mean, the reasons why do we have hotels at airports? I mean, one thing is the obvious one, right? Particularly so if you have airports that are hubs, that we have connecting to domestic flights, international flights, that's the obvious one, right? If you're transferring, you're staying over, you have a layover for eight hours, brilliant. And of course, you have... The other thing you have um, airline crews, big business line, gives you a nice, gives you a nice, gives you a nice space. The other thing is the distance from town, right? I mean, if your if your distance between airport and town is significant, you may consider for your early flights, you may consider just staying overnight at the airport as opposed to in town. So all of these things induce business into. Um, into, into airport hotels. Now, when, and the other thing, well, it's not always just the distance, right, but it's also time. <laughs> time is, I think, in, in a lot of the African, a lot of the African cities is actually more important than distance because you can, with free flow, you can, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you can be in, in the airport. This was but the problem is, in, was a it's, example, it's, right? it's not uncommon. I've been a lot to Nigeria, for example, and the longest time it took me from Victoria Island to Lagos Airport was close to five hours. So try planning for that. <laughs> generally, it's generally not that bad. Generally, you always have to account for three hours. I mean, if you do less than that, I mean, you're really, you're really risking it, right? So. So, but, um, so yeah, distance is important. But now, I think a good example here in Nairobi is that the, the, the distance isn't long, but now with a bypass in place, you suddenly can get from anywhere pretty much, from Kigiri, from, from Westlands, it'll take you 15 minutes, and it changes the landscape entirely. And I'm quite curious, and I've spoken to some people um, to find out what has been the impact. Because I think the hotels have been, the owners have been quite nervous about it. But strangely enough, and interesting enough, um, they've been quite excited and they've been able to attract business that they were not able to attract before. And that's particularly on the, on the conferencing side. I don't think necessarily you'll be driving to the airport to have a fine dining experience, unless it's maybe Subway. Um, but... Um, but conferencing is certainly something you can, you can tap into, right? Um, to answer your question, why we, haven't, um, why we haven't managed to secure any airport hotels as yet, um, and I think we're gonna, I hope we're going to approve this today because I would like to see some master plans, something that I haven't seen for most of the key airports to date yet. So having an understanding of the vision, right? Um, we've had a number of discussions with airports. Um, you know, one thing, don't kill the goose from the outset, right? So the, the expectations in terms of, in terms of concessions, the, 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 the fee lines, the upfront play, uh, payments, actually even confusing about the land rights, a big thing. Is it, is it a sublease? Is it a concession? There's one thing that investors don't like and they get very nervous about is um, confusion. And that's really <laughs> where uh, most of it has as line. And the airports, you've you got to understand the hospitality business, right? It's, it's long term. It's, it's not going to be a payback in a couple of years, right? So you have to account for that. You have to understand what makes um, hotels successful. And you know, having huge amounts of hotels are capital intensive, right? So, um, huge amount of capital outlay from the outset is is um, is not very accredited to your returns. Now, something 
that was that was last week. I was um, I live in Cape Town and I travelled somewhere in Africa. Um, well, being in South Africa, uh, South African Airlines isn't isn't the best airline right today. It doesn't have a lot of flights. So I was flying from through um, Addis Ababa, and it was a great experience. I don't know if you've you've you've, you've, you've experienced that now, but they've opened the uh, airport hotel within the terminal, and. I give you that, and I don't know why, but that's something that people should really start thinking of. Mm. Um, back when I, when I used to live in, in, um, in, in London, I used to work for a company called HVS. I had the privilege to work with someone called Gerard Green, and he was the guy who um, founded a hotel concept, was a co-founder of Yo Hotels. And this morning I was checking, and that's what he did, Yo Hotels in, within airports. You know, you don't need much. You need a bed. You need a space. You need time to uh, time to relax. And you can book these things, two hours, four hours, twenty-four hours, whatever that is. And the space you require is minimal. I mean, their rooms are about ten, eleven square meters less than that even. Um, the one in Addis Airport, I was very pleasantly surprised, but I think they've overdone it. It's it's a, it's it's quite um, it's quite lavish, I have to say. You don't need that, but I mean, if there's opportunities along those lines in some of the airports, um, definitely would be keen to keen to have a conversation. Awesome, thanks. And I mean, in, in terms of the investment piece, I guess it's not dissimilar to a hotel outside of an airport. It's it's similar. The um, the fundamentals are the same. Yeah. Really. And, I, and, and the other thing, because airport owning the land, um, I mean, they, they can really, in order to make the hotel successful in there, I think it's important to um, manage the supply as well. And they can do that. You have a master plan, and what you need to do is you need to scale, you need to phase this, making sure that whatever is in there is successful. Once it's successful, you can build more on it. A good example on that, and it's not an airport, but Century City in Cape Town, they have some three, four, four hotels, and they will only add another hotel into the market if a certain occupancy levels have been achieved. So making sure that you know we we build on real demand, and that, that that's something that the airport should really consider as well, rather than Blocking lots of lots of hotels in there and getting into a price war and, and so forth. Yeah, I think that's really interesting insight from an investor's perspective. You know, the airport authority ensuring that there's a environment that is conducive to getting your returns rather than having it flooded and you end up losing money. Um, I know Shamil's in the room, but he he wasn't here when we were first talking about airport hotels. I'd be interested in his his take on the expressway and whether it's been. <sighs> A positive or, or a negative for the hotel? Thumbs up or middle? Oh, <laughs> okay, that's interesting. We'll talk about that offline. Um, Patrick, saving you till till last uh, to an extent. What I mean from everything we've discussed here, what input do you have? Obviously, coming at this from a unique perspective in this panel as the airport authority, and where do you see the opportunities for investors to work with with airport authorities in? The Kenyan, but you know, Kenya also reflects a little bit on the African context. Uh, there are many, many opportunities, particularly uh, what about hotels and whatever. What happens in Africa? Airports have huge tracts of land, very massive. And what is critical? is for this, uh, the, 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 the law which governs how you can be able for investors to invest in the airport. It's not clear. It varies from one area to the other. In Kenya, for example, we have the, we have established now the uh, public procurement under the part, public partnership Act is already there. There is an act now, uh, 2021. And in that act, 
is very clear what the method of procurement you need to uh, follow. One of it is uh, like direct procurement. If we know that this is a very uh, good uh, hotel you want to establish in the airport, we can either enter into partnership or the, 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 we follow that or we do what we call open tendering. Mm. Uh, in airports, we usually, uh, we have also, uh, like Kenya Airports Authority, we have the uh, lease policy. There is a policy where we give over 25 years for a lease, which is very clear. And uh, we have also, uh, have the most critical that is missing, as you have said, uh, in the airports is also the master plan. Mm -hmm. The master plan showing where the airports can be located. And uh, indeed, uh, like now we have, in the process of finishing the master plan, which is in the procurement, in one of the hotel, uh, Jomo Kenyatta and the Wilson Airport. We will be able to roll it out to other airports. So a master plan is very, very critical to be clear that this is where some of these investments can be located. And uh, if I have to mention about the uh, Public-Private Partnership Act, the, it gives a leeway of so many ways that we can work in partnership so that you can be able to establish other establishment there in the airport. But the issue of land is that we have enough land. In all our airports, we have, uh, for example, in Kenya, we have over 18 airports. And there are others where we, even now, we are, we are planted trees. Therefore, there is a lot of opportunities that are available. Thank you. And on that master plan piece, vis-a-vis -vis the financing of it, is it correct to assume that the private sector would play a role in financing a good portion of the development of that master plan in terms of PPPs? Uh, private sector is very, very critical. It would play a, a very much a role. And uh, what we see is that now uh, most governments, even in Africa, we have that limitation of funding. Many countries now in Africa are targeting two things. They're looking at social uh, aspects like education, health, and others. And of course, there is the debt, the debt uh, because of the uh, debts that have been card. That's where now they are targeting. So there is little, if any, for airports. Therefore, the only other way now is to focus on private mm. partnership. There are many, many opportunities. And as I've said, particularly the law for public-private partnership now has given that leeway that auto airport authorities can now work together with uh, private investors. And an area for us to be clear is that uh, even the master plan, airports, uh, private investors can probably come in up our way. It's, it's an interesting chicken and egg that, because obviously if you invest in the airport, and we've seen it with lots of cities around the world, the airport is the lifeblood to the economy a lot of the time. So in order to help grow the economy, you need to invest in the airport. But there's other priorities as well that are competing for government funding, such as you know, the affordable housing, the social elements, health care, so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's, it's quite an interesting chicken and egg. Um, and yeah, I think the private sector is going to need to get more involved. Uh, very interesting. Jared, question for you on, on some of that stuff. So you know, the supply capping was quite an interesting point, the idea that you, know, you won't 
um, allow new hotels to be built like Century City until you've hit a certain occupancy level, performance level, whatever it is. Do you, have you seen that in other sectors within the airport space? Have you seen airports say, we won't let you build more than X amount of logistics space or whatever it is until that's all occupied? Yeah, well, the airport master plans are all mm. built on the basis of your, uh, your processing capacity, your peak, key, peak capacity point, whatever that may be, mm. and either of the processing points. That could be the highway, the toll station, the terminal, the cargo terminal, it could be whatever it may be, runways. So that's a core part of airport master planning, having um, a target number that when you get to that number, you should have already started to you know, start looking at your next survey or your next foundations for growth. Um, every single asset class, uh, certainly from, from Bangalore's perspective, I can speak, because the airport was growing from a, from a passion point of view at 42% year on year from 2000s, Onwards, it was the fastest growing airport in the world. It, it probably in the top three at the moment now, but it was then. When you're dealing with that sort of passenger growth, you, you know you you have to look 15 years, 20 years out. And so, to the point that the colleague was saying, 25-year leases. The leases in the 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 PPP agreements in Asia had been really tailored towards accommodating that long-term investment, they, they absolutely recognise that you're not going to get um, hotel chains and you know, F&B outlet mm. brand names to come in for 8, 10 or 12 years. That's just too short in the life of an airport. It's not going to happen. And unless Africa airports also look at that 40, 50-year outlook and look at their returns over those 15, 20-year periods, you're not going to get the players come in and invest 5, 7, 10, 15, 20 million um, India has done that well in policy level. And, and what's driven India is not, you know, the, the suddenly they've got the best airports. They've got one of the most um, conducive policies of growing aviation as the generator of GDP. And, and Bangalore's vision that, that was put up was all about, they rebranded themselves to be the new gateway to a new India. And we spent a lot of money on that master plan. And that's the other thing I'm hearing, you know, we may have master plans, we're not sure people haven't seen master plans. It is a fundamental must have to start with. Mm -hmm. But you've also got to spend money, good money, on a great plan with a strategy and a vision that you want to be known for against which a plan will be built. And that's what India and, and I think Asia, if you look at Singapore and Japan's and Korea's of the world have done, is that they've got a 50 year, uh, uh, and I, I remember a story with Changi Airport back in 1998. I went to see the airport director. And he had one of these old architect um, drawing draft boards, chests. Used to be sort of, you know, A1 size, size of the screen. And he had 10 of these drawers. And he said to me, Mr. Malik, pick a number any year over the next 10 year blocks. And I, I picked, I know, 2028. And this was in 1998. And he went to the 2020s drawer pulled out and said, this is how our airport will look in 2028. <laughs> this was, that's master planning. That's, re yeah. that's remarkable. And that's why Singapore is what Singapore is, because they look 50, 75, 100 years ahead and work back with that. Um, and there, when you're part of that journey, as you said, if you, if you can see the plan, you can see what you want to be part of, the investment will come. Yeah. But if you think the investment is going to come and it's just trees and grass... It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the shift. Policy with vision has to come, uh, which is what I've experienced, and it's really allowed me to see the sort of the growth happen. And I haven't, I've been in seven countries working, 27 airports I've operated out of. I've not seen one that's been a failure in those seven countries because they are, have that vision in that plan. And these are predominantly Asia and Middle East. Yeah, the policy is really important. And, and Africa, you know, you, you are now starting to see in East Africa particularly, I see if you look at what Rwanda's doing in terms of their vision, some of their plans, the plans of uh, Kenya are now starting to come. It's just now about how do you execute that at, at pace because you're now trying to leapfrog, let alone catch up. You want to leapfrog. Yeah, I mean, really important. You know, we talk to investors all the time about their exit, right? When they're making the investment, they're thinking, well, yes, I'll build this asset, that'll take me... You know, I need to get planning, I need to break ground, I need to actually build it. It's going to take me five years. If you've got a 25-year lease, and then I need to 
let it, stabilize it, and then you know potentially exit it. Right. Who's going to then buy it if it's a 25-year lease and you've spent 10 years with the asset? Who's going to then buy it with only 15 years left on the lease? And yes, leases are renewable, but it just becomes a harder proposition, especially if you're spending, you know, in the hotel space, you're spending tens of millions of dollars. You're not spending three, four, five million dollars building a shed. You're building, you're spending a fortune on this. Right. Um, it's really, it's really important. Yeah. And just to add to that, we yeah. wouldn't look at anything below 40, 50 years. You just can't. And on top of that, you gotta have to have very clear understanding of what the extension rights are. So that's also very tends to be very vague when you talking to the airports here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from an investment criteria perspective, yeah, that's really. I just want to link something to, to that. Although it's not necessarily um, a direct immediate revenue generator, to, just to give you to link to the sort of vision aspect of it, um, Bangalore Airport on its outer perimeters of the airport. And it has hectares of land. But on the outer hectares, one of its requirements was to build, and this is part of the sort of sustainability element and CRM that they had to do, because they occupied land that belonged to many, many villagers and rep- repositioned people. What we decided to do was, was to build these villages, rebuild the entire villages. And, and the reason we did that was it was the right thing to do, number one, because these people would have been living on that airport that is now making trillions of dollars billions of dollars. Um, but when we built the villages, we rebuilt homes and schools to what is any Western standard university in terms of building. We built them something that didn't exist in India. And that was because the vision was there that we wanted to make sure we had a supply chain of youth coming through back to the airport And if we didn't nurture their future by bringing them to the level of global, international, university-type education, we wouldn't be bringing the best people back into India. Because of that vision of learning and developing and nurturing talent, and the airport built five schools, recruited the teachers, provides all of the materials, and manages the maintenance of them as part of the airport's maintenance program. But what it's done is given them a guaranteed lifetime supply of resources that are loyal to that space. But also all of the spend from those villages now only happens at the airport. Whether it be shopping, whether it be you know, groceries, whether it be F&B related, or whether it be the hospital that's there, every one of the villagers only spends their money back at that airport ecosystem. So, yeah, that's the word. The and ecosystem so is... You've the got word, to, yeah. you know, that's a model there that, that, that also looks at doing the right thing The airport got funding for that through various government grants and sources as well as investors. But they had a vision that said, we want to bring these kids back into our ecosystem. To to the point earlier, how do you bring the youth back in? Yeah. Right. Um, And and through that, Bangalore has the world's only 42 female firefighting fire force that I've recruited and started. It's the only one in the world that has an all-female firefighting, for aviation firefighting, it's one of the toughest in the world. And, and those ladies, those young ladies, came all through those villages. Mm. Yeah. You right. remove that animosity that a lot of local communities have for airports being developed as well by right. supporting them, right? right? And you create that. So ecosystem. that partnership is about having the vision. So your master plan for me is not about just the infrastructure blocks. You know, Narco College absolutely correctly said, you've got to have these blocks that connect. But the vision that overarches, what are you about as an airport that needs to make money, it it absolutely must, and it's a gateway to the country, but it is bigger than that because of its ecosystem that it touches. When you can leverage that and turn that into money itself, it's a win-win. And that's what's happening in India, particularly at the moment. They've they've sort of cracked that nut, mainly driven by what Bangalore have done um, over the last 15 years. Awesome. Even if we say like the airport, we give 25 years lease, but there is the review, the mid right. review to see how you are progressing. Mm. So that is important. It gives us the indications on how your performance is and whether you will require more uh, time because the whole essence is the return on investment. We have to see that there is a win win situation. And therefore, it is no custom stones that it is 25. In some others, it's 25, but you will find that it's renewable another uh, term. 
and therefore it's where we work closely together with uh, the investor. Hilton. An another great solution is, um, you know, most of the airports, quite a few of the airports are, are constrained with their capital. Um, uh, one of the conversations that we've had is where the airport actually, we, we put a value to the land, the, val the land gets transferred into a special purpose vehicle, and if the value of the land is 10% of the overall tap uh, capital outlay, uh, you know, the, the airport takes part of, as a 10% shareholder. Mm. Um, it doesn't have a time frame to it. Uh, it doesn't put them under capital constraints. Uh, and it's a great solution for everyone. So they, their equity stake is the so land? So they have an equity stake, and the equity stake is the land. Mm. Okay. And that's, uh, that's a workable solution. And, you know, one of the other things that we haven't spoken about is the, the, the other tiers around and outside the airport. Mm. So, you know, we spoke, I spoke about the, the cell phones that are going to be coming into Africa. Um, you know, you need, you need spillover warehousing, you need bonded warehousing, you need dedicated customs clearing areas and those kinds of things. And, and the courier companies that are going to distribute these products out into the market, they need space and the support companies to them need space. So you have tier one, two, three, four, five types of tenants who need to be around the airport. Not all airports have the luxury of a blank canvas. You know, if you've got the luxury of a blank canvas, you can make things fantastic. I mean, Oatambo is a beautiful example of legacy issues. They've, uh, they've had cargo for even a day, but their cargo facility is absolutely chock-a-block. Mm -hmm. And the spillover warehousing is now 16 kilometers away in Plumbago. So, you know, product has to get processed through the cargo hub, and then it gets transferred 16 kilometers to the warehouse where it gets housed before it gets distributed. And that creates its own problems. Yep. So, you know, this master plan is all what it's about. And, you know, uh, it's, it's good to get input from various different sides. But, you know, if you've got a master plan and you've got someone who, who takes charge of the master plan and everyone's working towards the master plan, you have a common vision. And when you've got a common vision, uh, you're all going to get a result. And, uh, you know, if you, if you had to relate it back, and I'm a love, I love stories, if you had to relate it back to the Bushmen going out hunting, and they've been supported by their wives and they've sharpened their arrows and they've given them food and off they go and they walk for days and eventually they come across uh, a, a herd of antelope. Uh, and they all sneak up and they're now going to shoot the antelope and it's taken them days to get there. Uh, and if they didn't have a leader who pulled each hunter in under his arm and turned around and said, the, the, the antelope that we're going to hit is the one that's got the bird on its ear. And he goes to each hunter and he says exactly the same thing. And every one of the, the people in that hunting party has the exact same vision. And they're going to fire their arrows at the exact same time into the exact same animal. They will come out with a perfect result. If they didn't have that shared vision, they would each send an arrow into a different antelope and those antelope will run away and the whole world will bloody starve. So, so that's why it's so important to have a shared vision. And if you've got a master plan, uh, it's really easy. You can choose a number, you can open the drawer, you can pull it out and say, that's what my airport's going to look like in 28, uh, 2028. Okay. And uh, so, so for me, uh, it's all important for everyone to buy into the vision. And we, we mustn't do this as individual airports who just have their own vision. We need to have this as a... a, as a cumulative Africa vision. We need to have the, the vision of creating a cargo gateway into Africa uh, and how are we going to do this together. Uh, and you know, the guys have the ability to uh, provide that information. Uh, if, we have a, if we have podcasts, John, on an ongoing basis to bring us up to speed with what airport's doing what, uh, putting a subcommittee together that has uh, a dedicated lead for someone who actually has a, a database and can share information, uh, that's kind of the thing that we need to do. And I think, John, that's one of the purposes of this actual conference, is to actually do that, to get everyone to buy into the vision, uh, and we need to continually talk about it. You know, I, I watched a program on Arnold Schwarzenegger, absolutely amazing, and he said, you know, it's not only about making the movie, 50% is about making the movie, the other 50% is about selling the movie. Okay, and what we're doing here is we're trying to make the movie about this cargo gateway into Africa and airport real estate and resilience 
and the other part of it is selling it. Okay, and when you have this bigger vision, uh, you can go to the multinationals who want to come into Africa, who don't have the experience to come into Africa, and say to them, we can give you hubs here, here, and here. And I promise you right now, they may not take huge facilities, but they will take facilities and they'll come in and they'll test the market. And when they see how big the market is, they will then make individual decisions. And they'll say, in that area, we're going to take a 20,000 square meter facility. And in that area, we're going to close down. And that's what we've got to do. That's the vision of what I believe we need to achieve out of this conference. Yeah, thanks. And I thought I took a lot of notes, but if you need to ask any questions about this session, please find Hilton. <laughs> I think seven pages of notes, if I counted correctly. <laughs> um, thank you very much, guys. I mean, I don't know if we have a Q&A, maybe one or two questions from the audience. Um, there's a hand that went straight up over there next to Marla. Yes, sir, yeah. Oh, Mike. Uh, thank you very much. Kidai Moniki is my name, uh, Association of Aviation Training Organizations. Uh, mine is uh, to back home uh, our good friend Chonde from KA. Uh, yes, I, I, I do commend that. Uh, here I am. Yeah, I do commend that um, K has been taking action over the last uh, few years, and I think we are getting to the right. We are heading the right direction. Some of the uh, motivation to get us there is questionable, but we are getting there. Jomo is improving. Um, a few other airports around the the sector, the, the airport are improving. But mine, my question is, is very simple. You indicated the, and I can see the gentleman from India. Yeah, we're having coffee after this. Um, <laughs> that uh, he's indi you, you, you are very passionate, you are indicating about a master plan. And me, from where I come from, uh, I represent the industry because I'm on the ground. And the challenge is with KA, we have been talking about a master plan, like for Wilson, for... 12 years now. It has never materialized. So uh, what are reassurances are we getting that uh, we'll actually get a working master plan with timelines? Because it is an issue I have been following on for 12 and a half years, and it has not materialized. Second is uh, from, from KA, we have the challenge that from a legal point of view, you are lack for a better word, rudderless, because we have a challenge that the act that KA uses is outdated. Uh, it's a 32-year-old piece of legislation which does no, no longer addresses the issues that we have in the industry today. What are we doing? Are we talking to the political class so that we can have a new KA Act as soon as possible? And if possible, get regulations under it. And last but not least, can we get an investment policy because that is what we like. Good luck, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me start uh, from the area you have talked about, that there is no, I mean, the act is 32 years, uh, and uh, we need to review that. Uh, indeed, as you are aware, is that uh, uh, three years ago we uh, started reviewing the Act, uh, but because of uh, various issues we were looking at, it uh, and nowadays for the Constitution you have to uh, stakeholder participation is very very critical. There were issues that were raised during the last uh, uh, act review, and uh, we took them into consideration. Uh, apparently, we have again uh, uh, started the review again. There is, uh, I don't want to give timelines, but it has to be, uh, remember the process is quite long, because after they uh, take to the stakeholders, then it has to go even to parliament. And uh, therefore, uh, from K side, we will be able to finalize it, but uh, we don't have any control from the next level. Uh, but it is uh, uh, ongoing. If I talk about the, and in that, we will be able to do 
uh, even now, this time with the regulations. Uh, then your other question was about uh, the master plan. We have been having the master plan, particularly for other airports. The last one was done in 2011. Uh, mm. The new uh, master plan that we are doing is only that uh, it delayed because actually the procurement was non-responsive. Uh, but indeed, that one I can be able to give you timelines that uh, by December this year, likely to get a new, uh, the start of the farm to be able to start the work of the master plan. Excellent. Wilson Airport is one of our priority areas, particularly for Joma and the Wilson Airport. We would like to finalize the master plan for each. Uh, and remember, there is a lot of, uh, we have a lot of interest with the Wilson Airport. One of our, uh, actually, is the general aviation in Africa is number two uh, in Africa. So it's one of our strategic airports, and we want to see that uh, its master plan is well implemented, and there are many opportunities that uh, Wilson Airport, uh, when we talk about even hotels, you know, the distance from uh, the CBD to Wilson Airport is so short, and therefore there are many, many opportunities. Uh, once we organize the areas for Wilson, that is where it will be one of our uh, main uh, resource for ensuring that we are able to move uh, or add our uh, investment at the whole of K. The, uh, the last one you talked about, the investment policy, uh, is part of works that we are doing in uh, ensuring when we do the master plan, that will be part of it. Uh, but uh, the ministry had organized, uh, we have, uh, when we were looking at the infrastructure, the integrated infrastructure, uh, the key points that they looked particularly for JOMO, there is the investment plan. Uh, we'll be able, again, as I mentioned, that during the master plan, the investment uh, policy will be also be part of it and uh, you will be able to access. But uh, let me take the opportunity to assure you that uh, for Wilson Airport, uh, beside that in our strategic plan, is part of the areas that we are looking at to ensure that uh, those facilities are improved uh, within the uh, short term and the medium term. It has always been captured. And in the long term, then the whole uh, Wilson Airport will be changed to be able to ensure that it gives efficient uh, services and we ensure that the products there, that product is properly uh, improved uh, in the sense that it actually, uh, you know, Wilson Airport is our number three airport beside Mombasa. That was key to us. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. And we're way over time. So I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you guys. We're around, so anybody can grab us for questions. And just to close it all down and link it back to the investment, I think the big takeaway from this is that creating a long-term sustainable ecosystem around your airport will really attract investors and you know, private sectors key to helping governments develop um, their airport infrastructure and their airport ecosystems. So from an investment perspective, I think that's the key. And so, John, sorry for running late. But um, thank you very much, everybody, and thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.